This is the book we're presenting today uh, by Laurent de Suter, uh, Contriver de Sane Saba, o Prevado Suzanne Consult, uh, published by Masca, with the help of L'Institut uh, uh, Francaise. Um, so yes, uh, and it's, it's got a wonderful design. This is, I also wanted to say, I was surprised to see that this, uh, this, uh, this is actually a reflecting mirror. Um, I think it's a wonderful effect. Uh, I'll leave all the introductions and everything to uh, Madden uh, and Laurent. Uh, uh, I just simply wanted to say that, again, thanks for coming. Suppose I'll introduce the introducer. I let the introduction uh, of Laurent be done by Madden, but uh, Madden needs the introduction, so there you go. <laughs> okay, this works. You, you hear me? Okay. Um, it's a great pleasure, great honor that we have with us tonight, uh, Laurent de Suter. Um, I have to read this, uh, the, the, the list of his uh, achievements. He's a professor of legal theory at Ryan State in Brussels, and the author of 20, more than 20 books translated into a dozen languages. He has, he has been a visiting researcher, a visiting professor at a number of universities, Baseda, Bonn University, Yeshiva University, New York University, Cardozo School of Law, Université Catholique de Louvain, École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales, Université Paris du Okay, I stopped there. There's a long list, there's a long list of prestigious institutions where this is, with which he is connected. And as I said, there are, I think, 24, 24 books. Um, a couple of them are translated into English, uh, Narco-Capitalism and After Law. Um, and all these books are, uh, are actually booklets. They're, they're short books. I mean, this is the format he, he prefers. So they, they have the, the form of a provocation, intervention, manifesto, uh, in, in the best way. I, but, but this I don't mean something uh, light-hearted or short-lived because they all have a proper, proper academic backing. There's always excursions into the legal history. I learned a lot, actually, about this. I'm kind of ignorant about the subject. Excursions into the history of philosophy, into medieval philosophy, discussion, the dialogue with the contemporary, major contemporary philosophers. And, um, well, the books, uh, it's, it's fun just to read the titles. Uh, so let me give you some titles. The, it, it started in 2007 with the book called Porno Stars, uh, Fragments of the Metaphysics uh, of the X, the X rated. So you have this uh, connection of the, the high and the low, the porno and the metaphysics. And this, for instance, continues with this uh, title, Metaphysique de la Putain, uh, which is the metaphysics of uh, the whore. Uh, there is a book, uh, Contre l'Erotisme, Against Eroticism. He somehow takes stock um, of the results of the sexual revolution, let's say. There's a book on striptease. There's a book which is called uh, Theory of Kamikaze. There is a uh, History of Prostitution. There is The Poetics of the Police. Um, there is this book, Après la Loi, After Law, which is translated into English, which takes stock of the the obsession or the fetish of the law, the legality in, in, in our culture. Uh, there is a book uh, called Jack Sparrow, you won't believe it, uh, Manifest for uh, Pirate Linguistics. Uh, there is a book, Indignation um, Total, Total Indignation, which takes stock of uh, our addiction to scandal. Uh, there is a letter to Greta Thunberg. And there is finally, pour uh, finir avec soi-même, to finish, to have be, to be done with oneself, the book that is now translated into, into Slovene. The Wikipedia says your work is translated into 12 languages, so this is the 13th. Uh, the addition, the, the Slovene language, this is the inauguration of the number 13. Um, and uh, apart from that, there is also a number of uh, Edited collections like Deleuze and Law, Althusser and Law, and Zizek and Law. Um, so um, I read those titles to just give you the flavor and to entice you to read these books because they all 
all of them uh, try to go against the accepted opinion and uh, accepted, uh, the accepted widespread accepted assumptions, and all of them are sort of somehow counterintuitive in given the, the the general frame of mind of our age. All of them, each of them, uh, has a very precise focus and attacks some of the dogmas that we unwittingly hold on to. And, um, well, um, uh, true, true to himself, I mean, true to, <laughs> true to this uh, <laughs> being rid of himself, um, also the title of this uh, lecture presentation today is uh, More Alienation, Please. More Alienation, Please. I love this title. Um, uh, so, um, uh, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much, Mladen, um, for this, uh, this, this introduction that made me blush. I had to look at my, at my boots um, to avoid embarrassment. Um, so it's a, it's a tremendous pleasure and a tremendous honor to be among you today um, for many reasons. Um, one being, of course, the fact that it's always great that there's a book out and, uh, and indeed, in language, actually number 15 now, but it's <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's the first thing. Second thing, which is even more important for me, you, you know, I'm loving you, you know that. Like, I also have been a huge fan of what is called now internationally, what is known internationally as the Ljubljana School, even though I'm not myself a, a proper, you know, uh, you know properly versed into psychoanalysis and certainly not at the, the level that is, that is practiced here, but you know, I've been very, I, I can say, yeah, a fan in, this, in the literary pop cultural sense of the word. So I call it all the books and so on and so forth. And uh, so having the chance to be here uh, with you and, and, and today's invited to talk about that is uh, uh, some kind of a, um, you know, it's like, like, like the, the first part of the concept. So thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you very much also for all those who are involved. I will not name them all in the publication of the book or in the organization of this. I mean, um, from the bottom of my heart. Um, so more alienation, please. Yes. Um, maybe this is going to be the end. Actually, the title might come at, at the end of what I would like to, 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 to tell you today. Because what I would like to tell you today is First, very trivial things, um, things that belong to the history of a book. What is a book as an object that exists, that tries to crystallize ideas um, into some sort of a form that is destined to live outside and to live further down the speech of the person who utters uh, said ideas. Um, books are very important to me. This is something that Nadal has not mentioned, but I'm also a publisher. I choose to read one with a French publisher, Professor Universal de France, and one with an English publisher, Paris Press. And I'm very obsessed with books. Uh, I'm obsessed with books because these are letters sent to strangers and foreigners. These are letters and bottles sent to other times and other places. And for me, the ecology of thought is not in the living speech, as Paul Ricoeur used to say, but indeed in the uh, the writing of, of, of books. So the history of this book started, like all my other books, as the history of a desire to answer something that irritates me. So I start with, ah, oh, no, how about this? You know? And in this case, it was indeed a uh, question of self-help and the triumph of self-help and the importance of self-help, even to the point where self-help now, in the book business, so in bookshops, is what actually keeps within the bookshops the philosophy, sociology, the anthropology, the history of religion departments. Because self-help is part of the same department in bookshops and in the, you know, the uh, uh, business plan, let's say, of, of bookshops and, and publishers. So without self-help, it's something that bookshops, you know, bookshop owners have told me several occasions, without self-help, there wouldn't be any philosophy anymore in bookshops. So thank you, Safa, for allowing us to for helping us. For, for allowing us to, to survive so far. 
Nevertheless, this is irritating. You know, those of you, and we have had wonderful examples of the, this, the completely absurdity of, of uh, self-help books, and, and there was, I don't remember which book it was, but that was the book too much uh, for me, and I decided to try and find a, a way to react to that. And I wrote this book, which is the first of a series of books, um, of which a second has been already published, which is called The Praise of Danger, and then there is a third one uh, that is going to be published in a few months, which is called Disappointing is a Pleasure. I wanted to mention that because, you know, in case I disappoint you, so you know, you know where I come from. So, so this is the first of the series. And, and indeed, I started, like all the books that I write, I started it as some kind of an inquiry. An inquiry which, take, which takes the form of a little bit of the noir novel. If my books are so small, one of the reasons why is that, first, I don't want to lose too much of your time because your time is precious. But second is because I believe in intensity and I believe in some sort of nervosity of thing. I believe in the fact that thinking is not simply about ordering thought in a more or less rational and abstract way, but it's about affections, it's also about tastes, it's about the whole bodily involvement. I mean, I'm excited when I think, and I'm excited when I write, and I love to be excited by thought when I read great thinkers, you know? So I try to, to create a form with my books that is a, some kind of a hard-boiled form. So it starts with a crime, and then we have to solve it, and there are false clues, and then we go left and then the right and so on. So here the crime is represented by the book of a French uh, medical, no, not a medical doctor, pharmacist of the first half, the very early uh, part of the 20th century, whose name was Emile Coué. Emile Coué, perhaps is not that famous uh, in Slovenia today, but Emile Coué is the inventor of a method, the first existing method in French that is considered to be a self help method, which is a method that he had summarized in a very small booklet, um, which whose title goes uh, approximately by um, uh, you know the bettering of the self through self uh, um, uh, suggestion. So it's a book that belongs to let's say the late tradition of self hypnosis, or hypnosis, but at a moment when hypnosis was not that cool anymore. So he tried to rephrase it and reformulate it. And this idea of self-suggestion that he developed into this book was a way to try and, and, and get away with his first passion for those situation. And this book, the method that is told in this book, is a method which is extraordinary. It is based on a very simple thing. It's called the method Kue, you know, the Kue method. It's a method. And this method is, of course, exercises, things that you should do in order for your life to be less shit. And what you should do is, at the same time, very complicated, because you have to do it. But very simple. Because, you know, with simple things, we can build great results. And the exercise, there is one exercise that you should perform. And that you should perform as often as possible, three times a year, four to, uh, a day, four times a day, the exercise is the following. You have to stop, to pause, and to say inside of you, you know, to repeat the sentence inside of you, every day, in every respect, I go better and better. <laughs> That's it. That is the Kuwait method. And he wrote this booklet to say why repeating this mantra could save your life could help you get a job, could um, make you obviously a better person, but could also go as far, and he explains, he gives example in his book, go as far as to, if you're a woman, pregnant, if you repeat it strongly with you know, enough sense of imagination, uh, enough sense of suggestion and enough intensity, you could go as far as to influence the gender of your baby, that <laughs> it can really go as far as that. There's nothing 
that can be impossible to you if you lose that sentence in your head. So you say, okay, what the fuck? Believe me or not, this was a huge bestseller, especially uh, in Protestant countries, since self help was not mentioned earlier during the presentation, but self help comes indeed from a religious background, but mostly Protestant evangelical religious background, and especially American Protestant uh, background. So there's this whole idea that goes with the YMCA also for the bodily involvement of people, so gymnastics, but also all these exercises for the mind came from this context, this context of self betterment Kwe did that, had an enormous success there, a little bit less in Catholic countries, mine, perhaps we can discuss that, perhaps God, please. And all that, and the fact that we are doomed uh, and we are entrenched in our guilt as Catholic makes things a bit different. Uh, I don't know. But what's striking is that it still is a You go in a bookshop, certainly in France, in French speaking countries, but also in the United States and the United Kingdom, in Switzerland, it's huge in Switzerland, you still get new edition today, new publication of this book. Um, that continue to sell at risk level. And what fascinated me in this book is not, okay, the story is fun to tell, right? But what fascinated me in this book is, of course, the centrality that a very, simple, a very important concept taken from the history of philosophy, the concept of the self, the self and the self suggestion, and the self that you have to nurture and to take care of in order to indeed uh, uh, become a self that is better, the first. So taking into conscious of the self in order to render possible to transform yourself in such a way that yourself is more than yourself, so to speak. But still this self that is more than yourself is the real self that you've always been, something like that. Something kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. It was funny to see that in this book, but also generally speaking in, in, in self-help literature, the self is everywhere. And I started to ask myself, or what's related to this, uh, why is it so? Why is it so that this literature is so fascinated and so anchored into this concept? And then I did what I always do. I started to wonder whether what we know of the self in the history of philosophy is not something completely different than what we think or what we thought it was. And I used also a little trick, which is a mean little trick, and probably something which more serious inquiry than mine, that I don't really care, would, would probably discard, but I encountered a few very troubling, uh, strange, um, let's say, um, scenes in the history of itself that made me think that perhaps there was something fishy about that. And the book is about how fishy it is, so I will not tell you the whole story so that you're going to read it, and to buy it and to avoid it. Be nice. Uh, and among these scenes, there were a couple that particularly were important, I think, genealogically speaking. The first one is, of course, the Greek scene, the one that has been used repeatedly by Michel Foucault, for instance, in his later book, you know, when he was speaking of the care of itself, and that's something which was part of the transformation of, let's say, the Greek, a certain Greek understanding of precisely the idea of exercises into the early Christian one. And first thing that I noticed, well, because I started reading, rereading through both, obviously, on the question of self, is that there's no fucking self in this. Where did it come from? Where the fuck did you take that? There's no single idea of the self either in the Roman world. There's no idea of the self when you read the history uh, okay. There's no idea of the self in the medieval times. There's no idea of the self in the Renaissance. The self, the self of we, about which we are so obsessed, we start seeing traces of it at a very specific, decisive moment when it, it was decided that a concept of the self was needed, theoretically, philosophically, to, let's say, help ignite a philosophical revolution. The self appears at uh, the beginning of the 17th century. There is no trace in any 
language, Italian, Spanish, German, obviously English, of anything that resembles the self before that date. And suddenly, at that moment, boom, the Pascal with le moi, you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the me, the me, the me is readable. Descartes with the I, the I, and most importantly, of course, John Locke, who is, according to the historians of language, the first one to have substantivized the self, to have used self as something that could exist outside of the reflexivity that the question of self involves in language. But the fishy thing there, and the thing that made me think, is the use that Locke does of the self, the definition of what he calls conscious, is by him ascribed to a very, very specific institution. And this institution is the institution that he calls himself the person. It's a very famous passage of the essay on human understanding. He say, okay, the self is this thing that uh, uh, manifests the conscious of the individual, the conscious of the individual as a person, and he adds person being a concept coming from forensics. So what he tells us explicitly, and I still don't understand why the historians of philosophy have not taken better care of, of this strange declaration of Locke, is that the self is not a philosophical concept. The person is a juridical concept. It's a concept that comes from the history of law, and more specifically, from the history of Roman law. The person is not the self, let's say, the development of the, the individual in the possession of its own faculties, and then uh, experiencing the possibilities of its life through you know, analysis and so forth. The self is the hair of a vision of the individual where there was no self, I said, you know, uh, in the Latin world, but where the person, as an institution, had very defining function. And the function were what was were what? Keeping the patrimonium intact. The person in Roman law is the juridical function by which goods, possessions, uh, richness, you know, richness, pass from one person to another. That's the only use of the person in Roman law. There is no other, you know, uh, understanding possible of the person in that respect. So I started to say, I said, okay, fine. That's that's, that's strange that it has been forgotten. But what is even more strange is the fact that, you know, there was this nice remark, I don't remember who one of the four speakers before mentioned that, that is this, this quote by Ken Levin saying that science borrows from philosophy. Well, borrow, philosophy apparently borrows from law also, and the only lesson that I could draw out of it was to say, okay, so it means that the self not only is something which is quite late, which arrives at a moment with Locke where the sense of property Ownership also changes, and suddenly, as property changes, we need a concept of the self, of the person, as the one that will guarantee the new type of property that appears. So the self is not a function which is metaphysical or even ontological, but a function which is first and foremost political, but political not in the sense of collective organization, but in the sense of institutionalization of a certain legal order of the economy. This was, let's say, the intuition, or the list, one of the, the, find, the little findings, the little tricks, the little things that I found that, is, that made me decide that, okay, I had to tell that story, if only to outline the fact that, in this case, as in many cases, language, the language that we use, is full of traps. And that the intuition that was formulated by Roland Barthes, you know, in this famous inaugural lesson at the Collège de France in 1977, when he said, okay, I'm here to talk about uh, literary semiotics to you. Uh, but literary semiotics is, of course, speaking of language. But speaking of language is speaking of power. And speaking of power is speaking of 
fascism. He says, I'm going to speak about the fascism of language, because every language is fascist. Every language is fascist. Why? Well, it's fascist not because it prohibits you to do things, but it's fascist because it forces you to do things. It leads you into a certain direction. It channels your ideas, your thoughts, but through your thoughts, your sense of possibility, and then through your sense of possibility, your sense of action, in a certain way. That's the fascism of language. And it's something that I've always, and that's always been important to me. This exercise that I've tried in this book was an exercise in unfolding the hidden fascism, let's say, of this word itself. Try to explode it somehow within the context of uh, self-help, but also the context, and that's perhaps a funny part of, uh, of the book, the concept of self-help that is anti-self-help, because there's a new trend now in self-help literature to say, ah, oh, no, 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 we'll stop it now, this book that tell you how to be better, and so on and so forth. You are shit. You know, we are all shit. Let's get satisfied with the fact that we are shit, and, it, and we will be all so happy. You know? And there's, there's the, subtle art, the subtle art of not giving a fuck, uh, this book by this German author, I'm a shit and I hope to remain so forever. You know, there's, yeah. uh, there's a whole trend about that that tries to avoid the pitfalls of self help literature while still using, obviously, the same tools and the same underlying intellectual architecture that leads back to this juridical substructure. So, this is, I, I, I will stop there because I've already yeah, spoken a bit too much. But this is, let's say, the underlying, the underlying tone and direction that I'm trying to give to this book. So it's an inquiry through self-help about the legal fascism of the concept of the self. And hopefully, but because, you know, as we like to end, how to make so that we, you know, cheat with that fascism, to use again one of the words that that was use themselves for speaking of, of literature as this thing that cheats the fashion of language. So there's an attempt of try an open path there that will not um, reveal um, outside of this dimension of self without falling too much into mysticism or the forgetting you know, the illusion of the self and forgetting of the self and so forth. So this is basically the book uh, what the book is all about. So I, if you're curious um, I hope you I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much for this. Well, uh, thank you very much. Yes, this was very helpful as, a, as an entry to the book. Um, first, I will mention um, Kue. If he is known in this country, actually, not as a self help. Or whatever, he's known through an old Kusturitsa uh, movie. I don't know if you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where there, there's a character in the movie which actually says, his Svakov Dano, Svakov Pogli, the Swedish And keeps repeating this through the movie. Uh, which somehow the movie was popular, this is like. It's maybe? I don't know where it Earlier, I think. No, 81. 81. 81. 81. Okay, 81. It was the 80s, and, and this then turned into a proverb in Yugoslavia because of the movie. Okay. I mean, <laughs> this was the beginning of Kusturica, who, you know, the one Rampi Khan, etc., etc., and had a questionable subsequent career. But never mind. I mean, at that, at that point, this. Uh, it's curious that this, uh, uh, this phrase started to circulate in Yugoslavia and socialist Yugoslavia as a problem. Mm -hmm. So everybody of that generation knows it. Um, yes, well, what I love about your book is that uh, you, you take this notion of the self, getting rid of the self, of the self, the, the self is the most um, precious possession that one has. And uh, yes, there's the entry to the uh, self-help literature. Uh, okay, it is a very handy, handy entry, and indeed there's a whole uh, cult of the self through self-help literature, even if in those uh, negative theology, as it were, terms, 
uh, in, in the form of loving oneself with the ship. Uh, but it, it, goes, it goes further, I mean, by its implications. And um, I mean, the self from the self culture, which is, uh, which is so endemic, so it becomes so endemic, to particularly identity politics. And uh, where actually a notion of uh, being, uh, being recognized as that particular true identity and uh, being proud of it. And uh, seeing the social repression as something which prevents me from being myself, and this is uh, this is still the mantra of the left. I mean, the, the identity politics is one of the major major strands. In the all the sexual norms, all kinds of norms, but they they always see the infringement of the society upon the true selves in one way or another. So this is the construction of the argument. And I think that uh, your book actually tries, tries to undermine precisely this, this as, as, as a basis of a leftist politics and, and uh, presents a, a completely different kind of uh, assumptions on which to build a different kind of politics. So I, I don't know, my first, I mean, my function is just to throw some balls at it, or play ball, you know. <laughs> and uh, my, my first question would be, uh, is, could say something more about the implications it has for this identity politics of the left as the most widespread sort of field of political struggle today. Well, th thank you. Thank you very much for that. Be before answering the question, I, 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 it's, it's funny to say, to know that you mentioned this week's and speaking of Korea, it's funny to know that during World War II uh, and around uh, the, and the, the time of Vichy, when was already dead, but his, his queer schools were very much alive. The queer movement was openly, you know, uh, openly uh, uh, collaborative um, and openly in favor of the, the strong regime. So uh, there are sinister uh, also overturns uh, going with the simplicity of this method that becomes at some point a, a, a network of institutions at the global level that works for a a more most problematic uh, uh, ideology. Uh, <clears throat> but that aside, indeed, it's no. I I I I try to trick things, as I said, and I try to <laughs> hide things at the maximum. Uh, this is something perhaps that comes from the fact that I've always had this these things for the a group of of seventeenth century. Uh, writers and thinkers who are dubbed by historians the libertine, the erudite libertines, something like that. It's, it's, uh, which is it's something that belongs to uh, French history, people like Camus, you know, like the, uh, uh, and you saw here, well, the people that nobody knows actually. Uh, they are completely forgotten, but I, I, I love the fact that these guys. We're living in a very strange moment where they were unable to. It was dangerous to speak in the open, so they would speak half, you know, half in jest, half in jest, you know, like. They would make the people guess. So I try always to avoid being too explicit about what would be my position, especially politically speaking, on any ground, because I want to the books to feel like. Um, quick sense in which you are taken, you know, and your, your ground suddenly becomes shaky and you are not certain of anything anymore. Uh, but now we force me to express myself in, in a more, you know, open way. And it's complicated because we know that, of course, identity politics is a big problem, but we know also that the denunciation of identity politics is a big problem uh, because it has been used very strongly by the right conservative right, precisely as a way to attack a series of movements of emancipation on a series of communities um, of all kinds. So it's very difficult to tackle this issue without giving weapons to the right. So indeed, I have a problem with identity politics, but I didn't want to stage it, stage it, stage it sorry, 
like that. Like if I had a problem with identity politics, I simply make a detour at some point through a, a field of ruins. Because when suddenly you have deconstructed somehow this idea of yourself, you have made this trajectory throughout its failure and throughout the reality of its program, suddenly what's left, let's say, uh, what's left to the left, so what's left to the poor, is yes, indeed, it's a field of ruin in which you evolve with things that are crumbling or always already, that have always already crumbled, you know, Hegelian and perhaps uh, unity of the thing that has been there is the part of the thing that is the only unity of the thing. Um, so indeed, I'm, I'm trying to offer a landscape in which it becomes impossible to play for it. So I don't want to denounce identity politics, I want to make the claim for identity impossible, which is very different. So that it's impossible to rebuild your identity as something desirable, but also as something possible. Uh, so that we can suddenly ignore the problem, if you'd like. Uh, problem is like in the go, like in the go playing, like, rather than playing chess, which is the traditional reflex of theory, um, I try to play go and to simply, you know, make things vanish discreetly in the, in the margin rather than attacking them or trying to, to, to destroy them. But there is an explicit paragraph, you know, towards the end, where indeed the question of being nothing, being whatever, uh, not the, not the whatever of Agamben when he speaks about the, uh, what's, the, what's, the English, uh, what's the English version of the uh, community, uh, the, 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 the whomever community, whichever, the whichever. Um, it's about, about becoming, not becoming no one, not, not disappearing in oblivion, but becoming literally Anybody, you know, like it doesn't matter who you are. Um, I don't know how to translate that in English. I'm so used to the French text. It's the first time I speak about it in English. So there are, there are several word plays, so I don't know how to translate it to Slovenian. But it's about becoming uninterested, it's getting rid of I'm interested. We are not interested. But we are not interested even in the fact that we are not interested. It's not, I'm a shit and I'm proud of it, right? No, it's an interesting point. And this is, this is the, the only way, let's say, that we can deal with the fact that, indeed, we are nobody, but not nobody in a tragic sense. Or not in a, even a comical sense. Although, although I think, yeah, maybe, perhaps, in a comical sense. Uh, I'm, I'm in, on par with Arinka uh, Dukhansic in, in thinking that comedy is much more important than tragic. Um, because it has something to do with the real, whereas tragedy has almost symbolic perhaps. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's let's say the move that I'm trying to, to say. It's, it's to make ridicule of the idea of saying I'm someone. Saying I'm someone suddenly should become after the end of the, 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 the book the most grotesque thing that one could say or what could aspire to. Because there's this thing, you know, we have to become someone. In the end, no. we're already one in the sense of we count for one, more or less, and that's enough. Okay. <laughs> so, not someone's, we don't need that. Great. Um, yes, I, I have a, perhaps a question about the, actually, 17th century. You said that the, the very emergence of the self replaced it in the 17th century, and yes, uh, that's it. Beautiful analysis of Locke and his use of the person, and the, the, the shift that took place at that point. And now you mentioned uh, Pascal and Descartes, you know, but um, as a counterpoint to this, in the 17th century, actually you had, um, you had major thinkers, writers, uh, who saw the move up, uh, mm. precisely as the major thing, uh, the love of the self. And uh, you can see the, the, the French, so-called French moralists, like uh, Chicot, Bernard, mm. or you can see Molière. I mean, the Molière, the uh, move up, says the love of the self is, is the sin from, from which all other sins somehow uh, follow. And uh, so it's curious that, uh, and this goes then, uh, 
is there's the same path of living from himself. Who makes a distinction between uh, and this one. So he, he tries to find a, a good mm. love of the self and against the arrogant uh, self conceit. Uh, so, uh, what I find curious, okay, this is a historical question of historical background, is that the, the, at the very moment when the self emerged as a, as a figure, you had actually a very strong uh, continent. Which identified it as the privileged enemy, as the enemy from, from which actually all other flaws, character flaws, uh, follow. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. I told you that it was shaky, right? <laughs> that, that someone who knows better would. Um, yeah, 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 sure, absolutely. You're absolutely right. So I have, I have two, perhaps two, two possible answers to that. First is. I'm probably trans would translate to self love, and not so much love of the self. So, so love of the self would be amour de soi. Uh, in the case of, but amour propre would be self love, and indeed, it's not because the self was not there that self wasn't there. Because reflexivity, forms of reflexivity in grammar, uh, in thought, and so on, so on, are as old, of course, as, as English. But it's the substantification, the substan yeah, the sub substantivation of the self that suddenly makes it, made, made it a thing. And you're right to say that there, is, there was something very deeply ambiguous to that. And that, you know, Pascal is, the I is hated. You know, you have to hate them. The I is this, like, this thing which is disgusting. You know? So there, there is a strong uh, fear with, with moralists uh, in a context, of course, where the situation of the, of the individual should always be measured and compared to um, the, the presence of God. And of course, the affirmation of the self in such a context is always the mark of a form of pride um, that is contrary to the humiliation that one should experience and feel towards the, the presence of God. And the, of God. And the question of here of the relationship with God is, of course, very important. Also, in the case of Locke, because Locke had a different relationship with God. He has this relationship with God where the question of be a good as a Christian uh, is to work for the glory of God. To work in the, for Locke is to work the property, to work with the ground, to work the soil, and to try and, mm -hmm. and produce food in order for the self and the individuals under the eye of God to to multiply for its uh, greater glory. So there's this thing, and uh, again, the religion, let's say early capitalism, uh, and the figure of the self that he considered in a good light, in the sense of this expansion of the self through land, or the expansion of the land through the selves, whereas Jansenis Pascal or, or Rousseau with this very strange relationship with, with religion would, of course, follow the other path. That would be, let's say, the, the, uh, the dangerous situation that I would uh, say to the fact that I indeed overlooked what you, you, you very rightfully mentioned. Yes, there is another association that can be made. I mean, the, from the, the, the word in English, from what follows from the word self, is the word selfish. Uh, so, you have the denigration of the self following, I mean, it's described in the language, following the self is actually something bad. But the word selfish is interesting in the, in, in the way that it was used in the 18th century, I'm speaking about Adam Smith, an early, mm. early series of capitalism, where actually the, uh, uh, the bad inclination of being selfish was suddenly seen as a good incentive to building the self which can build the capital. So selfish is suddenly becomes uh, an asset because uh, it's only by fo following ourselves, all, uh, also in our, our selfish uh, sort of uh, inclinations, that would this is this would be the best way to care of, to take care of the community because the community will somehow and arise miraculously from everybody following the selfish interest, which is the the starting uh, fantasy. 
So there's the self and selfishness connection, which, which is a sideline. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that is this is one, of, perhaps, of the suggestions that I that, that I try to make in this book is is indeed that what self help, contemporary self help, tries to offer is, and it has been said also by the speakers, but um, is indeed first an individualization of problems that are collective, but also a moralization of problems that are political and. Economical. So, if the problem of the self becomes the problem of values and a problem of feelings, then of course all the structural dimension of not only the concept but what the concept bears with it suddenly becomes forgotten. And what I would like to, what I wanted to try is, of course, to speak of the self without never ever speaking of sorry psychology, never ever speaking of morality, moral moral categories, to remain at a level of total impersonality, because these are forces that force themselves through language, that then inscribe themselves inside of those who use this language, and who are somehow programmed, or reprogrammed by this, uh, this software that language is, which is impersonal. Uh, well, they are individuals, they are, but the forces themselves are impersonal, and are, because they are impersonal, they are political and they are economical. So, the whole story is about the law, power, and capital. It has always been, and it is still today. Um, and this is why it is it's urgent that if we want to uh, uh, do something about it, that's why I go back to the discussion of identity politics, perhaps uh, it is necessary to re-put ourselves at the structural position and not at the moral and the problem of the left today is that it has to be a mostly moral uh, form of looking at the world, which has to be for the structural ambition of, of you know, power, law, activity, police, politics, capital, and so on, which are impersonal machines that are very much better organized in that sense in organizing and in organizing collectively because the bodies are taken by impersonal forces. And it's not simply myself and then myself and then myself that will do the revolution. No. Yes, the, the, the moral indignation, the, the one of your books is precisely about this. What does it tell about ourselves? The, the, we, we want to have so much indignation. Um, I, I would nevertheless, uh, be, before I open the floor to, to the audience, I would nevertheless uh, like to ask you, press you a bit, it, about some things you have in your own abstract that you didn't, didn't speak about. But uh, I'm, I'm profoundly intrigued, uh, of course, by the question of ontology. How does the question of ontology, of being, the true being, being the self, ontologically, as a ontological category, actually, you, you, you say in your abstract, that uh, ontological category designates an anchoring of such a self, uh, rather than being a place of truth and emancipation, it is to the contrary, the space of politics of imprisonment. So you have a sort of um, very decided, you take a very decided stance about uh, ontology as such. Mm. And you know there are famous passages by Lacan in the, in the seminar, uh, where he speaks precisely about ontology, the discourse of the master. And uh, that, that being is always l'être à la botte. Mm. Uh, which, which is not, I don't know what is the good English translation, being at once back and forth is, is, uh, is, is the, the official translation. So the, there is this very strong being, actually, the very most abstract notion of being. One should always read it with a sort of exclamation mark. Somebody tells you, this is what you should be. This is how things are, because this is how things should be. So is, is ontology doing as such? I, I, do, I do think so. I think that all, all ontology is actually deontology. Okay. <laughs> uh, so there is no such thing as being, but only different forms of ought to be. So there, there's, there's a, there, 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 uh, the distinction between the two, that was also a, a product, by the way, of, of 17th century English Scottish uh, philosophy, is completely misleading, really. 
And, and I think that, that we need to start, and this is what I've tried he here and then in some other books, to try to unveil the deontics, the, the sense of obligations and duty and then the sense of police, in the most neutral, apparently neutral, uh, descriptive uh, category. I've done that here for the for, 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 for self, I've, I've done for, for you know, the category of Danger, for instance, have done for, for others. Behind this, there's always a machine that wants you to do something in certain areas. There's always this fascism again, uh, of which uh, that was published by this book, speaking of. And, uh, and I think that indeed there is there a huge question addressed to philosophy in general, uh, and it's in its attachment to, um, to ontology, ontology particularly. And to the refusal to see, I've had a discussion with that, uh, about that with Ebali Barro, because he, he is one of the specialists of Locke and of this precise passage that I discuss in, in the book. And he notes, he, he has observed, and he's not the only one, Alain Libera also, and lots of specialists have observed and said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's weird. Suddenly Locke says, okay, the self, the person, the, the self is anchored, anchored in, a, in a person, but this person is a legal thing. And then they just say, okay. And then they go on with their lives. Guys, it changes everything. What's the problem? You know? And to me, there's, there's a high stake now for philosophy, which is a stake which is not a stake related to its deconstruction. The deconstruction, philosophy is very good at deconstructing self, deconstructing, and so on and so forth. But in recreating, recreating somehow the genealogy of the form of police that it allows. Because there's this idea of philosophy frees and, and helps us get in higher. No, philosophy is very good at imprisoning. And ontology was one of the major forms of discourse, more than metaphysics. I have the feeling that metaphysics, classical metaphysics, as a matter of fact, was in its craziness, casuistry, and so on and so forth, was less imprisoning than modern ontology, so to speak. And, and so, yes, I. Definitely a problem with category of being. Uh, because for me, it's, the, it's what allows the self. The self exists only because it is. You know, it's who I am, who you are. Trying to find the true self is to try and reconcile with who I am. Who are you? You are what you are told to be because you are told to be. Don't be. Why would you be? What, what's what's the, the nice thing about being? We are hobby, we are me being, we have everything that you want, but what is the. No. So, indeed, there is this here also a stance of positioning towards, um, towards that. that um, yeah. So, more alienation, please, is also more non being, please. That, you, that, that is um, this idea that the proprietary, again, the ownership, damage of the proper, like in, pro, like in property. Uh, that is inherent to the idea of self. And then the idea of being, is being that we are, but that we own at the same time. Uh, I, I, I think that alienation as getting rid of your property, as some form of ontological communism, so to speak, uh, uh, suddenly it's, it's, it's indifferent traits or indifferent uh, uh, features that suddenly come to the fore. You know, I have brown eyes, I have a stupid history, I have a family. I have this and that and so on and so forth. All things that everyone else has, you know, they are, let's say, the, 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 the ensemble of what I've, I'm made only are perfectly impersonal. What makes me, or this thing that is here, this called Laurent Monsieur, is made of perfectly uh, uh, generic traits. My hair, my arm, and so on and so forth. I can decompose myself. And when I reach my core, my core is simply made of impersonal generic features. So um, the idea of alienation is a more alienation perhaps comes from xenofeminists when they say that if, they are, if we have a task that wouldn't be an obligation, we should do it or we don't, you know? But if we have a task, it's about building this impersonality according to our own choices and not according to the choices that ontology, politics, capital, and so on impose uh, some pose upon us through the category of the self or the category of the
Good, excellent. No, no, my last question was about alienation, to come back to the title of your talk, but you already somehow answered this, and you have uh, this beautiful line at the end that uh, alienation equals emancipation, so that you can actually kind of, I mean, uh, link the Latin etymology of the two things. You, you can always translate it. It's a little yes, bit, it's a little bit far-fetched. But, okay, but, 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 but between the idea, the idea of the, se, the alien, so the senos, and the idea of the ex, the ex yeah. of emancipation going outside of emancipation, so the hand that is on the body, also in Roman law, uh, on the body of the, the one who is immature, there's indeed something which is, which is there, very strong, between foreign to the family of the father who owns you. Yeah. That's at the same time alienation and Good. I think uh, we, we had our, our, we thing, our, our, our developments. Uh, I think we, this is the time to open the, the discussion to the public. To open the floor. So we do have some time for uh, the open discussion. Uh, the oxygen levels in the room is very high, uh, but there are, sh there are certainly questions that need to be asked, so go ahead and ask them. Otherwise, I can be. I would be happy to sign copies and to have discussions with you <laughs> informally <laughs> and to have a glass of wine. Yes. Uh, I'll use this opportunity. Oh, there's a question. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you for the interesting and intriguing uh, presentation. Uh, I have a question, and I'm sure that this question was already posed at some other presentations of this book. And it could be posed also to the previous talks, but when we are talking about self-help books and self-help discourse, one can uh, observe a certain kind of uh, distancing or um, these, these are things what others are doing, you know, and we are doing something else, real science, real psychology, real philosophy and things like that. But, you know, uh, one can observe here certain competitive uh, relations toward this self-help discourse, which is, I would compare it with this uh, relation between Platon and Sophists. So these competitors are somehow cheating. They are using wrong means to, to do something similar as, as what we are doing, you know? And, uh, but not just, this is not a critique of your book or something like that, but you know that the, the, the title of the book, it could be a title of a self-help Perhaps we cannot, and that would be the end of it. But oh, I, I come back to that. First, uh, a little anecdote. Um, so I told you that I'm, I'm a publisher, so I love, I love to trick readers. Uh, and also I love the books to sell a little bit so that I can write another one behind it. The publisher will not be, oh, no, come on, we have enough of your shit. Nobody wants to read it, so uh, get lost. So there's the idea of, of I love the idea that by tricking through titles and little devices, people would buy it for the wrong reasons. And then they would hope to do, to find something, then they would start reading it. They would either be bitterly disappointed, but that's too late because I bought the book. Uh, or they would say, oh, that, I, I didn't think of, of this, and it brings me in the di direction, and eventually it eventually it's, it's nice. No? <laughs> So there's the, there's this thing, and in this case, so I, I came up with with the title because I love stupid titles. But then the funny part for me was that the publishing house I don't know if it's if it's if it's here uh, or not, but the the, the French publishing uh, house said, why don't we put a red ruban, you know, on the on the bottom to make it you know, a bit more, and that we put on this. Um, 
it's a subjacket, um, the entire manual of self help. And I said, yes, let's do that. It's bad taste. I love it. And, and that's exactly what, what happened. So I think that when you go on Amazon or, or whatever, there must be some very bitter comments from readers who, uh, who felt cheated. But honestly, yeah, I, it makes me laugh. Uh, so that's one, that's one thing. But for the serious part of your, of your question, is this a very serious part? How do you make a difference? And indeed, it would be fun to try and, and create some kind of self-help books, you know, niche, niche. And I don't think it exists. There are these, you know, popular philosophy books where, you know... A person uh, can save your yeah, life. But, but be, being, being happier with, 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 niche, uh, with Nietzsche, understanding the world, with Plato, uh, uh, finding joy with Spinoza, and so on and so forth, you know? <laughs> so there, there, there's, there, 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 there already is this thing, this thing happening. So how do you really make the distinction? I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to know. As well. Because if I could come with a clear distinction, I think that I would recreate a field of thought where the question that interests me, which is the question of possibility, suddenly so would be sh again shut down by an action of police that I don't want. That's why I've always preferred the Sophist of Not Plato, by the way. I'm on the side of Sophist against Plato. If I have to choose, to choose a, to choose a yeah, but still, Plato is Plato, so uh, let's embrace Plato as well as the Sophists, you know. So th that would be the answer. It's not a satisfactory answer, I suppose, but I think that this is the only one that would not, that I can see, that, that would not recreate some kind of a, uh, a privilege. I take my responsibility in mocking these books, but I'm perfectly ready to get the tomatoes in my face, you know? Mm -hmm. It's part of the, it's part, let's say, of, it's part of the game, but I don't want to claim that there, is, there would be something inherently philosophical or theoretical that would be inherently above uh, what self-help books uh, offer. In reality, you know, they are bad. But uh, in theory, it's, it's, your question is not only legitimate, I think it's precious, because otherwise we would be... Um, would, yeah, we would become satisfied moralists. Uh, again, that wouldn't be the case. We just want to have fun. All right, we have uh, time at least for two more questions. Uh, so, should. May, may I just oh. interrupt for a moment? I think Susanna Kunsut uh, just Oh, okay. She's uh, the translator. She's the translator of the I'm book. Sorry. So she put the round of and she deserves an applause. So, yeah, Alenka. Alenka. You don't need the mic. So, thank you very much for writing the book and for this uh, really, really nice uh, presentation, introduction into what it wants, what it is, what it wants to achieve. And actually, my question is how. Half serious, half not serious, but I was uh, kind of at the end of your presentation, I was kind of struck by this idea when you said at the beginning very nicely how you start writing books when something irritates you. That there is this moment of irritation to which you respond by writing the book. So let me phrase my question like this. Is the thing that gets irritated in you yourself? <laughs> 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 Another trick question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm so exhausted with myself. <laughs> oh, if only, if only. No, I mean, is, uh, is there any kind of other notion that you would work with here? Or any, I just don't, don't want just to play with words, just anything, you know, what is it, let's say, is it the need, is it whatever? <laughs> what is the, uh, uh, because I really think this is probably how most of us Work. Yeah. I mean, is, it the, is the notion of the subject make any sense to, uh, to you as perhaps different from itself? I, I, you know, I, I, try to, I, try, I try to deal with all that um, because subject also has an interesting history and also it's a history which is extra philosophical mostly, uh, which is also legal. Mm. No, that's, that's the fact that I'm not a philosopher, but I'm a lawyer. So I tend to bring things back to. <laughs> In my turn now, it's law now. Uh, 
so I tend to, to, to bring things back on this direction. Uh, and perhaps there is a huge Agam Ben dwarf, you know, on my shoulders, seeing things in my ears in, in that sense also. Um, so I don't say, I wouldn't save the self with the subject. On the contrary. Um, it's the whole vocabulary that serves philosophically to uh, describe the coordinates of the individual, the person, maybe the, 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 the we want. That, yeah, that is problematic for me. And I know that there has been attempts by Slavoj and others to, to save the subject from this fated uh, destiny. But I've not, or by Anna Madhu, but I've not bought it. Um, except understood as a purely structural place. That, that, that I can, that, that of course I, I can, I can sign uh, without, any, without any problem. So, um, yeah, so this, this whole vocabulary for me, it's, 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 it's a vocabulary that, that, that remains, yeah, that is very problematic and that poses the same problem as the problem of the, as a category of the self. The only one that, indeed I, I, it's not that I save, but that perhaps uh, is given a little bit more room in this book is, is the person, because person means nobody. And, and then in the fact that person indeed is this juridical category where the human figure disappears behind his, his wealth, his house, and so on and so forth, so it becomes nobody in front of uh, his goods and his patrimonium. I, I, I love that. Uh, I love the fact that things are stronger than us. So, so, so. Um, but, but, you know, but it, become, it, become, it belongs also to a terrible uh, <coughs> culture of, of ownership and property, which was the Roman culture. Of this, and it was terrible, so. Yeah, I don't have any satisfactory... I don't come with a, satisfact with a, a satisfactory concept at, at the end. Um, Can, yeah. can I actually ask, uh, oh my god, this is going to be the final question, I shouldn't, so maybe there, if there's... Yeah, okay. okay, go ahead. I, I, I'm very sorry, it's very rude to come in late and then ask a question, but I, I have a pressing question, you know why. It's a very simple one. Uh, how do you rate the chances of the human understanding of being to those of the chatbot? Or is that perhaps an irritation that might appear in the next book? Ah, the chatbot, uh, like chatting with you, so on and so forth. I don't know. Uh, for me, it's a. I mean, me, it's the same existential question eventually. No, because for me, a chatbot. I mean, like, I will answer by using uh, ideas that are not mine, but the the ideas of Boris Kreuz on that topic, which for me is it's, it's spot on. The problem with um, chatbot or ChatGPT and others or artificial intelligence, and so on and so forth, is that it's a matter of electricity. You pull the plug, and that's it. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> which, which, which indeed makes a huge difference, because when you pull the plug with us, you know, where's the plug? Right. <laughs> um, on that note, uh, we'll have to end. Just before we thank the, uh, the speakers, I wanted to mention uh, one more time. Uh, I, I wanted to thank uh, Maska, uh, well, on behalf of Masca, actually, I wanted to, want to thank the French Institute and the Faculty of Arts uh, for co-hosting this event. And um, yes, there is the announcement is that there is uh, beer available in the fridge outside. Uh, the idea is that you uh, give uh, one coin or two coins uh, in the box and take as much as well. Take one, <laughs> <laughs> one drink, one coin, one drink. And, oh, another thing that I wanted to mention that um, Lohan de Still was obviously uh, an author that uh, has been on the target for Masca. We were uh, appreciative of his books for quite some time. But uh, Blaben was actually instrumental in deciding that this is the book that we should find. Uh, Blame it on him. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so this is also the reason why we invited Blaben to, uh, to, to host uh, or to, to, convert, to converse with Lohan today. And I was very happy uh, with how it went. And uh, please, uh, let's uh, give them a uh, uh, <laughs>
Signing, signing, signing.